And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. And he took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all... If, if Asa was king in the Vatican right now, how many priests would be left in the Vatican if Asa took away all the Sodomites? Uh, he took away all the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols. If, if Asa was the king in the Vatican right now, how many statues would be left? <laughs> Not one. He removed all the idols that his father had made. And also Maaka, his mother, even her, he removed from being queen because she had made an idol in a grove. <laughs> you know what that is, right? The idol in a grove was usually the goddess, the fertility goddess, the queen of heaven, who is always surrounded by bushes and roses and flowers and all kinds of things still going on today. So if Asa was the king right now in the Vatican, he would have eliminated, number one, every priest that was homosexual. Number two, he would have removed every idol in every Catholic church around the world. And then he would have said of this so-called queen of heaven, we're not having it. You're putting up images of this queen of heaven, this goddess inside these groves. I want them all destroyed every one of them. So can, you can imagine the shrine at Fatima, the shrine at Lourdes, the shrine at Guadalupe, all the uh, Marian apparitions that have you know happened all throughout the last several hundred years and all these Mary, Queen of Heaven Catholic churches. If Asa was king in the Vatican now, it would be a much different church, wouldn't it? Anyway, he, anyway, because she had made an idol in a grove and Asa destroyed her idol and burned it by the brook Kidron. And then he said to his own mother, get out. You're not going to make a mockery of my God while I'm king. Whew. Well, we need some more. We need some more popes like that. We need some more preachers like that. Amen. Um, let's make some other, in fact, I, I let the AI chat GPT, uh, make some other correlations and I've checked them. The AI was scarily dead on with the correlations of how Mary is seen now with how these other Queens of heaven were seen in history. Another similarity between the two figures is their association with purity and chastity. In Sumerian mythology, Inanna was considered to be a virgin goddess, meaning that she had never been married or had children. She was associated with sexual purity and was often depicted wearing a veil or other modest clothing. Similarly, the Virgin Mary is often depicted wearing a veil and is considered to be the epitome of purity and chastity within the Roman Catholic tradition. Woo, that's scary. I mean, scary that this woman, that Roman Catholics, apparently they never admit that they worship her. But they worship her. This woman that Roman Catholics worship and Inanna, this goddess of the Sumerians way back, way back in the time right after the flood in Nimrod's time, being worshipped almost exactly and seen exactly the same way. And then just out of the blue, this, this took place in about 15 seconds, this AI gave me, and I asked it to give me about 500 words of the correlation between 
Mary worship as queen of heaven and Inanna, queen of heaven. And that's what it came. I'm almost ashamed to use it now. That's how spot on it is. Now you can say, well, computers can be wrong. Computer came up with that. You do it. You do your own research. You study Inanna. You study Mary and see if there aren't correlations. And again, here's the point I'm making. All of the ways that Mary is worshipped as Queen of Heaven, none of those ways that she's worshipped that way come from the Bible. None of them. They all came about over the several hundreds of years of Catholic tradition. One guy around AD 400, AD 500 says that Mary is our queen. Well, that's not the gospel. That's not even the apostles. Okay. And then it was just added to from there on out. Finally, I think it was Pope uh, Pius. Uh, the recent Pope Pius that finally said, yep, she's queen of heaven and we adore her and all this stuff. So it's pretty much Catholic dogma now that you pray to Mary, that you worship her, that you venerate her, that you burn incense to her, that you give gifts to her, and that basically she is as much your savior as Jesus is. And we know that's not true. Now, this is from... Uh, I mentioned Pope Pius. This is from the Wikipedia article on Mary as the Queen of Heaven. And here's what Pope Pius said. Uh, Pius XII explained on the theological reasons for her title of Queen in a radio message to Fatima on May 13, 1946. He says, He, the Son of God, reflects on His Heavenly Mother the glory, the majesty, and the dominion of His kingship for having been associated to the king of martyrs in the work of human redemption as mother and cooperator, she remains forever associated to him with a practically unlimited power in the distribution of the graces which flow from the redemption. Jesus is king throughout all eternity by nature and by right of conquest. Through him, with him, Subordinate to him, Mary is queen by grace, by divine relationship, by right of conquest, and by singular choice of the Father. Let's, um, let's do this, okay? Let's take um, um, Mozart, okay? The composer Mozart. Uh, without a doubt, one of the greatest composers in modern, we'd say modern history, you know, relative to like ancient history. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of compositions. Um, great works of opera, symphonies, uh, Mozart's use of the clarinet. Oh, Absolutely astounding. I love the, his clarinet music. Mozart was this um, amazing, gifted composer. Who was Mozart's mother? M Mrs. Mozart, maybe? We know that his father had a very um, heavy hand in Mozart's life. We don't know anything about his mother. In fact... In all of the music penned by Mozart, none of it is signed by Mozart and his mother. We don't know anything about her. Thomas Edison, okay? Gifted inventor, gave us the light bulb, gave us the phonograph, gave us uh, motion pictures. What's his mother's name? We don't know. Elvis Presley, okay, American singer, very famous. They called him the king, right? Now, we know that, Mo, uh, that Elvis was very dedicated to his mother, okay, very dedicated to her, loved her greatly. 
but she really had nothing to do with his life, his songs, his music, his popularity, nothing. Okay? You see what I'm getting at? Just pick a president. Pick your favorite president of all time. Okay? And then ask yourself, who was his mother? And how come she's never mentioned in the history books? See, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way in the Bible, and it doesn't work that way in history, and it doesn't work that way when it comes to salvation. There is absolutely no mention in the Bible whatsoever, not even a hint of it, that Mary has any powers when it comes to us receiving grace from God, us receiving redemption and forgiveness from God, and yet, Pope Pius said, uh, attributed to her with practically unlimited power. In other words, whoever Mary forgives is forgiven. And that, my friends, just isn't in the Bible anywhere. I'm sorry, but it's not. And if it's not in the scriptures, you have to ask yourself, where did this come from? I don't. I have an answer to it. I believe that it's the spirit of Babylon who always, throughout all the Bible, when you see types of Babylon like Jezebel, we mentioned, or Herodias, here we have John the Baptist preaching the gospel and preaching and preparing the way for Jesus Christ. And then he goes to Herod and he says, Herod, it's not right for you to have your brother's wife as your wife. Well... Herod's wife didn't take too well to that, and so she said, I want John the Baptist's head on a charger. Okay, that's who Babylon is. She hates God's word, and she hates the law, and she hates the fact that there's a preacher there proclaiming sins that she's guilty of. I've Listen, I've pastored for years, and I've seen those kind of people come in and out of a church. They're all fine with you until you start preaching their sins, and then they don't like it so well. And that's how it's always been. Jezebel, it was Elijah who basically defeated Jezebel's prophets, 400 prophets of Jezebel that were trying to show who God was. And Elijah won. He clearly won. And then Elijah had all of Jezebel's prophets killed. And Jezebel said, well, the same happened to me then if if by the time the sun sets, I don't have him just as dead as my prophets are dead. Of course, that didn't happen. God spared Elijah. God was on Elijah's side, not Jezebel. So anytime I see this female spirit moving in and taking the place that Jesus alone has, I say unto you, that is Mystery Babylon. We mentioned Isis a while ago. Here is an image of Isis holding her little son, Horus, uh, getting ready to feed him. And there are numerous paintings of Mary the same. So I'm asking you, if you look on this page here, can you really, 100%, would you bet your soul on which one of these is Isis, which one of these is Mary. Just because one of them's wearing this solar disk, the images, most images of Mary have the solar disk right behind her head. They call it a halo. Would you bet your soul on it? What about Isis? One of these is an image of Isis with her foot on the moon. And one of these is a picture of Isis with her foot on the moon. See, you can't tell me it's Mary. You can't tell me. In fact, this image, supposedly image on the left, is of Mary, her head surrounded by 12 stars, and her feet on the moon is taken from Revelation 12. Now, we're going we're gonna to look at that in a little bit, okay? I mentioned to you that 
the queen of heaven, the phrase queen of heaven, is mentioned in the Bible. And you say, okay, see, there you go. That's where our church fathers got it from. They got it directly from the Bible. They pulled it right out of the scriptures that Mary's the queen of heaven. Actually, they didn't. Actually, when you look in the Bible, you'll find queen of heaven, I think, mentioned about five times. And in all five times, uh, her worship and them offering incense to her and doing things unto her and giving her veneration was strictly forbidden by God to do. In fact, God got pretty angry at the Israelites who venerated Mary and worshipped her. He got really upset. It's one of the reasons why they ended up in Babylonian captivity. We'll start with Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 17. Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Now, whether this was a reference to Inanna or Nut or Ashtaroth, probably Ashtaroth, or Isis or any of these others that are throughout history referred to as the queen of heaven, none of this, this is not a reference to Mary. In fact, God says that the mere fact that they're making cakes. You, and I'm not talking about like birthday cakes or anniversary cakes. We're talking about, you know, most civilizations in the, in the Eastern civilizations have a flat bread. Okay. They just pat it out and they put it on a, a pan or something like that and heat it up and turn it over and heat it up and that's their bread. Okay. Well, they're making these little cakes of unleavened bread to the queen of heaven. Sound familiar? That's what they're doing. And God says, in doing that, they are provoking me to anger. Now, God did not uh, later say in the New Testament, now that Mary's the queen of heaven, it's okay to make cakes to her, which is what the Eucharist shall be. We don't have God changing his mind here. We have God absolutely saying, do not worship the queen of heaven. Do not make cakes unto her because that makes me angry. Remember, God's a jealous God. Jeremiah 44. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, Peter, Paul, uh, all the saints, all the gods, that, all the statues that Catholics have, and all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, in Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done, we and our fathers and our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. So now here's the mistake that the Israelites are making, it is the mistake that 1.2 or 3 or 4 billion Catholics across the world are making. It's the same mistake that any Protestant pastor makes when things are going well in his church and people are coming in and the offerings are coming in and he's getting a raise and 
you know, he's hiring staff now so he doesn't have to do all this work. And he, he just says, boy, God is really blessing us. Listen, let me tell you something. The devil's got a whole package of rewards too. Temporal things on this earth that we like to look at and say, that's, that's the sign God's blessing us. Well, of course, of course, Joel Osteen is God's man. He's got 90,000 people in his church there, and he's got millions of people all over the world that read his books. That doesn't make him the messenger of God. Does it make him a preacher? Does it mean that God is blessing what he's doing? Just because he's popular, just because he promises wealth and health and plenty of food to everybody, that doesn't mean that God's in it. That's the mistake they're making. They're saying, since you told us that burning incense to the queen of heaven was going to bring down God's wrath. Well, we're telling you that since we've been burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings and making our little cakes and all, and our kings have done it, and our fathers have done it, and everybody's doing it. That's one thing the Catholic church says. What other church can claim that it's a universal church with churches literally all over the world. That's one of their claims of why they're right. And that doesn't work. That doesn't, that doesn't match what Jesus said. Straight is the way and narrow is the gate and few there be that find it. That's what Jesus said. But they're saying, since we've been doing all this for the queen of heaven, why? Look at the number of people that are worshiping her. Look at the number of people that are well fed. It, that's just, it just works, right? Uh, burning incense to the queen of heaven looks like this now. Yeah. I mean, it was easy to find that picture. Burning incense to the queen of heaven. She's got her crown. And of course, that little child in her arms, we're, again, we're to assume that that's Jesus and we're to assume that that's Mary. But they look different than the other paintings and the sculptures that we've seen. It, it's sort of like, you remember the TV show Bewitched? Okay, one guy starts out playing Darren, the husband, right? But a couple years go by, he's got severe back problems. He's in pain all the time. He's got to quit the show. So they bring in another guy. They call him Darren. And the TV audience is supposed to think, well, that's Darren. Yeah, that's Darren. Sure. They said it's Darren. It must be Darren, right? And the truth of it is, we're all looking like, that ain't the same guy I was on last year. Who is this guy? Okay. Everybody figured out that they had to replace the guy being Darren. But because they told you he's Darren, the show went on for several more years successfully. And people just bought into it. But it was two different guys. Okay. Could you pull that off with, like we mentioned Elvis Presley a while ago. So a guy grows up out of Memphis. He plays the guitar. He sings. He shakes his hips on the Ed Sullivan show and girls are screaming all over the place. And he's Elvis Presley up until about, oh, 1971. And then he decides he don't want to do it anymore or he dies or something happens. And so we bring in some other guy and he's going to be Elvis Presley now. And it work, does it? That's my point here. With every statue and every painting, they keep changing how Jesus looks, how Mary looks. And we're all told that's Mary and that's Jesus. But none of them match each other, much less we don't even know what they look like in the Bible. So how is it that we can carve them out and say that's Mary and that's Jesus? And then why burn incense to an idol? Does an idol smell the incense it has a nose does the idol see uh pope francis here giving his adoration and his love and his uh worship 
to this statue, does the statue recognize that out of Pope Francis? No. And yet you're told to believe that because he's doing this in front of the statue, it's the same as doing it in front of them in heaven. The only problem is Jesus doesn't look like this in heaven. And Mary is not seated at the right hand of Christ, interceding for us on our behalf to Jesus, who then intercedes on our behalf before God. The Bible says there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. It says nothing about Mary, the queen of heaven. Jeremiah 44 again, verse 18. This is, the, they're continuing uh, what they're saying to Jeremiah. You said, Jeremiah, that we need to stop worshiping the queen of heaven. Well, while we worshiped the queen of heaven, we were well fed and all of the kings and everything, everything was great. But here's their complaint now. But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven, oh, let's go back to that picture, and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? Then Jeremiah said unto all the people, to the men and to the women and to all the people which had given him that answer, saying, the incense that you burned in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, ye and your fathers, your kings and your princes and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them and came it not into his mind so that the Lord could no longer bear because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which ye have committed. Therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without an inhabitant as it is this day. So they're trying to say to Jeremiah, while we worship the queen of heaven, we had all these great blessings. And now you tell us not to, and oh, it's so bad. And Jeremiah says, well, let me, let me explain something to you. All those burnings of incense, let's go back to that picture, to the queen of heaven. And all the cakes, the Eucharists that you made unto her and said people had to eat them and, or they couldn't go to heaven. And all of that religion that you were full of back then, God finally got to the point where he couldn't bear you anymore. He couldn't put up with it any longer. So now your land is a desolation. God's removed you off of that land and you're suffering the consequences of it right now. God wants you to know that you can burn all the incense you want to to the queen of heaven and think that she's going to bless you. But if God closes up the windows of heaven, if God turns the ground into, into brass and there's no rain and, and there's a famine everywhere and people are starving to death and if the, Nebuchadnezzar the king comes and takes you off the land, that's God telling you that he's way more powerful than your queen of heaven is. And then he says this, continuing on, same chapter. Because you have burned incense, and because you have sinned against the Lord. So let's stop right here. He's saying that burning incense, making cakes to the queen of heaven, is not honoring the Lord. It's a sin against the Lord. And have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, nor walked in his law, nor his statutes, nor his testimonies. Let me explain that. That is God's way of saying, you followed the traditions of the popes and the Nicene Council 
and the Vatican Council and Pius XII, you followed what those men told you, but you left the commandments of God. And the commandments of God, one of them said specifically, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Since you left the word of God and started listening to men, here's what's going to happen. Um, therefore, this evil has happened unto you as it is this day. In verse 24, moreover, Jeremiah said unto all the people and to all the women, hear the word of the Lord, all Judah that are in the land of Egypt. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hands, saying, we will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. In other words, some of you, hopefully, who are Roman Catholic are listening to this. And most of you probably are going to say, you know, I don't, this idiot, I don't care what he says. I know what the Pope says. And I'm going to do that. And I know Mary's hearing my prayers. I pray to Mary every day. And I know she hears my... So you're not going to listen to a word I'm saying, right? Here's what God says. Verse 25, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hands, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. Ye will surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. Therefore, hear ye the word of the Lord, all Judah that dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, saith the Lord, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying, The Lord God liveth. Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good. And all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by famine until there be an end of them. Now, whether this happens uh, in a way whereby literally armies come in and kill everybody and uh, all of a sudden, there's no food to eat for anybody, whether it happens that way or there's another way it could happen. Whether it happens the sword, which is the word of God, stands in judgment against you and the famine that you have. He told Amos in the book of Amos, there shall be a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, but of hearing the words of the Lord. That's an even worse famine than just not having food to put in your mouth. God says, I'm not going to let you have any food to feed your soul with. So however it happens, it's going to be a judgment from God against those who having heard the truth now you've heard that the truth is no teaching in the bible whatsoever establishes mary as the queen of anything she's not even the queen of judah she was nothing more than the lord's servant who obeyed the lord did what God asked her to do, brought forth the man-child into the world, present at his crucifixion, witness of his crucifixion, witness of his rising again, and receiving the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, just like everybody else did. And when the disciples there on the day of Pentecost, when the apostles got up and they were preaching the word of God, did any of them say, See this lady here? When she ascends into heaven, she will be the queen of heaven. Not one word out of any of the apostles in the Bible giving her the title 
or the, even the idea of the queen of heaven, not one. God says, you continue in that, then I'm going to take my word away from you. And slowly but surely, you're going to starve to death and have no food to eat. And the sword, this book, is going to be the one that judges you. I'm not your judge. The Bible is the judge of all mankind. Now, along with uh, Jeremiah, in fact, Jeremiah pretty much is the only one who mentions the queen of heaven. But we have now a connection. As we've tried to do in every one of these series, we've tried to connect what we learn about the Vatican, its doctrines, its practices, the things that it, that it does and so on, with what we see concerning Babylon the Great. We have another connection here, found in Revelation chapter 18. And it's in reference to Babylon being the queen. Revelation 18, 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double, according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified. In other words, those who are part of Babylon are going to get a double whammy at the end. Double judgment. How much she hath glorified herself. And listen, I've read the, the different Marian apparitions. And in the ones that I've read so far, Mary always appears and says, I want you to, in this place where you see me now, I want you to build a shrine unto me so that you can adore me. Okay? Instead of her saying, seek only God and follow him and only follow Jesus Christ. She doesn't do that. She tells and commands everybody, follow me, adore me. And in that sense, she's an antichrist taking the place of Jesus Christ. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, look at that, and have no widow and shall see no sorrow. Therefore, Shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine? And she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And that is pretty much identical to what God told Jeremiah to say to them. For worshiping the queen of heaven that God was going to give them famine and destruction at the sword and everything like that. And here now is the queen herself, Babylon, saying, I will see no sorrow. I will not see any. And God said, and yet in one day, you're going to see death and mourning and famine. And you're going to be utterly burned with fire. We mentioned earlier, um, this idea of the lady, our lady, which is a uh, sort of a uh, royal way of saying our Lord, only it's a woman and it's our lady. And we have a connection between what Babylon said here in Revelation 18, I said a queen and I'm no widow and shall see no sorrow, with something Isaiah said concerning Babylon. And the fact that, remember, Inanna was the virgin queen of heaven. Mary is the virgin queen of heaven. And now we're going to find out in Isaiah 47 that Babylon 
is the virgin queen of heaven. Isaiah 47, 1, come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground, there is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. So all the titles given to Mary, virgin, queen, lady, our lady, all of those we now find out have been taken and used by Babylon herself. And again, since we have no teaching from the Bible telling us to revere Mary, adore her, pray to her, confess our sins to her, ask her to mediate between us and Jesus so that Jesus can mediate to God. Since we have, not only do we not have any scripture telling us to do that, we have scripture telling us that it doesn't exist, it can't exist. There is only one mediator, and it's Christ Jesus. And to add a mediator to that is an abomination. So here we have the virgin daughter of Babylon sitting not on a throne, but on the ground. And God says, you no longer are going to be called tender and delicate. And then later on in verse 5, same chapter, Isaiah 47, here's what he says. Sit thou silent and get thee into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans. That's the Babylonians. For thou shalt no more be called the lady of kingdoms. You see, back in the days when the Catholic Church pretty much had control of most of Europe, every king that lived had to give obeisance and obedience and reverence to the Pope, and to the Virgin Mary, okay? We have a state in America called Maryland. It literally is Mary, Mary's land. They named it after Mary. Virginia, the state of Virginia and West Virginia was called on behalf of the Virgin Mary. So there's always a connection with politics here, always. The lady of the kingdoms, our lady. Remember, instead of our Lord, it's our lady of kingdoms. I was wroth with my people. I have polluted mine inheritance and given them into thine hand. Thou didst show them no mercy. Upon the ancient hast thou very heavily laid thy yoke. And thou saidst, I shall be a lady forever so that thou didst not lay these things to thy heart, neither didst remember the latter end of it. Therefore, hear now this, thou that art given to pleasures, that dwellest carelessly, that sayest in thine heart, I am, and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. That's almost identical to what Babylon says in Revelation 18, I sit a queen and am no widow. Back here in Isaiah 47, I am and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. But these two things shall come to thee in a moment and one day, the loss of children and widowhood. They shall come upon thee in their perfection for the multitude of thy sorceries and for the great abundance of thine enchantments. Do you know what an enchantment is? Uh, it comes from the Latin word canta or cantata. And an enchantment in magic terms is the repeated um, verbalization of certain words of power. So if I were to use the Pharaoh's uh, magicians there in Egypt, they used enchantments to turn their rods into serpents, just like Aaron's, you know, Moses took his rod and it became a serpent. 
but Moses' rod ate up and swallowed up the Pharaoh's rods. But anyway, they used enchantments. And basically what an enchantment is, it's a repeated spell or prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of you get what I'm going what I'm saying. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Nuns sit and I've seen them on uh, EWTN TV. Eternal World Television Network, Catholic Broadcasting. Nuns sit and it's televised, holding their rosary beads. One after another, repeating the prayer over and over and over and over and over. And you know what Jesus said about that? Jesus said, don't be like the heathen and use vain repetitions for they believe that they shall be heard for their much speaking. In other words, it's the belief that if I pray the prayer only once, God won't hear me or I haven't proven my worthiness to God. And yet if I sit for hours and repeat the same prayer or mantra over and over and over and over and over again, then it becomes an enchantment. And it basically says, because I have said this 100 times, or I've said this over the course of three hours straight, then surely God Zen, through Mary, will forgive my sins. Mary will pray to God for me so that my sins can be forgiven. And people, let me just give you one verse out of the Bible that would disprove all of that. It's Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, God is not holding a contest to see who can pray the loudest or who, see the, the, the prophets of Baal that Jezebel had. They screamed to Baal. They were cutting their flesh, bleeding all over the place to show Baal their worthiness. All they needed was Baal to send down some fire from heaven to light the sacrifice on the altar. And Elijah, I like Elijah because he's got a little attitude. Elijah said, tell you what, uh, take 12 buckets of water, dump it all over the wood, all over the, uh, the ox laying there, dump it all over the altar, make a trough around it and just keep dumping water on top of it. And the Bible says Elijah prayed one time. And fire came down from heaven. Not only did it consume the wet wood and the sacrifice, but it consumed all the water that was in the trough around it. It was all God. Well, he prayed one prayer. You know, for three and a half years, it didn't rain in Israel, in Samaria. And, and it is because the Bible says Elijah, who was a man of like passions as we, he prayed one time that it wouldn't rain. And for three and a half years, it didn't rain. And after three and a half years, he said, okay, God, let it rain. And it rained. And you match that with what you're told by the Catholic Church and by EWTN and by all these nuns sitting and repeating the same prayer over and over and over and over and over again. Only the strong will survive. Only those who endure to the end could get their prayers heard. And yet, the Apostle Paul said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, having now learned that, yes, there is a queen of heaven mentioned in the Bible. But you find out that she's the enemy of God. 
you find out that her spirit really is mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The question now is, what will you do with that information? Will you say, as those in Judah said, while we was praying to Mary, we had everything. I've been blessed. We've had a good life. Everything's fine. But what you don't know is, your sins are not forgiven. You've called to the wrong God, or in this case, Goddess. Call upon the name of the Lord. You can pray directly to God through Jesus Christ and have no need whatsoever of any other mediator between you and God. Try it. Call upon the name of the Lord and see what God does for you. This is Pastor Mike. You're the reason why we do what we do. Keep us in your prayers. You certainly are in ours. And we have still a lot more to give out of information concerning Vatican's secrets. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.